God is good. All the time. And all the time. Is it is great to gather in the name of Jesus and, and uh, praise his name. I have been looking forward to today all week long because um, this is always the high point of my week, to be able to worship and gather in the name of Jesus. And I just want to, as we move toward Easter, each week there is going to be um, in the lobby or the North X or where you come in, whatever you call that, okay, there's a little recessed area in there that's going to be uh, developing and changing each week. And it's a place where you can go and focus and pray and consider about um, what Jesus had, has done for us and, and what happened along the way to the cross of Christ and to the resurrection, right? Sue, I want to get it. Cause there, so anyway, we're doing that, and we encourage you to, um, on, a, on a Sunday or even throughout the week, to come in and pray and utilize that space um, during this uh, Lenten season. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I want to begin our time with, uh, with a prayer. Pastor C is going to come and share a call to worship. And, um, and let's give God our full attention this morning. Father, we are here because you're the living God, and we love you. And Lord, we want to praise you today. And, and Lord, I know I've been praying all week, and, and I know that uh, your presence, your Holy Spirit is here. And Lord, we need to be aware of that. So we ask that you would just fall on this place in a way where we know that you have something for us today. And Lord, we, we want to praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I wasn't going to use this, but I'm going to. Steve's coming. Uh, this morning, we, right as we finished going over the songs for this morning, Michelle hit one, of the, one or two of the lower notes on the piano, and it was buzzing. Like, we couldn't figure out why it was buzzing. And um, we're looking through, and we're, we finally pulled back the cover of the piano a little bit, and we shined a light in there. And I saw something shiny in there, and it was a medallion from a necklace. And so we pulled it out. I don't know how it got there, but things happened. We pulled it out, and the medallion said, Be still and know that I'm God. <laughs> Be still and know that he is God. No. Our call to worship this morning comes from First Peter. And it is chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. And uh, just a great passage to remind us of our salvation in Jesus Christ. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The reality is, uh, everyone, many of us, some portion of us, uh, come into this time, this place to, to worship God, but we come in grieved by various trials. And uh, just a powerful, powerful reminder that even in the midst of the trials of life, there is rejoicing because of the salvation of Jesus Christ, the newness of life that comes from him and through him. And so I'd encourage you this morning as we, uh, as we sing songs of praise together, as we listen to God's word and the, the message that he's given Pastor Phil for us this morning, uh, that we rejoice even if it's tears because of our trials, even if it's sadness, that we rejoice, that we give glory to him. Shall we sing together? Amen. It is... Uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, I want to ask that you open them up to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 3 and chapter 4 a little bit. Um, 
But before we get into our text this morning or do anything else, I want us to read the key verse for today from Romans 8.28 together. Can we do that? God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. God works for the good of those who love Him. You know, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if you are following Him and if you're serving Him, you know that, uh, that he, call, he has a purpose for you. And that is to glorify His name. Do you know that in the midst of whatever the trial is or the struggle is, God still has a purpose for you. And God is able to use what Satan seeks to disrupt us with. He can use it for His good, and He does. Father, today we are gathered in your name. And Lord, today I ask that you would help me to share your truth, your way. To be obedient to your leading. And Lord, we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if, uh, if you were able to see it Thursday night or not, but Thursday night they had a live stream from Asbury um, yeah, that was coincided with the Collegiate Day of Prayer. It was, a, it was on from, I think it was on from 8 to 10, or a little bit, went a little bit longer than that. But um, as I was watching that, and I was thinking, it was, I think, the 200th Collegiate Day of Prayer. And as I was thinking, I could not help but to think this, God's plans and God's purposes are always Perfect. His plans and His purposes are always perfect. You know, we've been talking about it, we've been hearing about it on the news, the revival at Asbury. Um, there are times where God moves in such a way where the world notices, and even people who want to say that isn't God have to, have to notice because something happened. I mean, something happened at Asbury after a chapel when 20 people stayed to pray and others began to come back. They got the attention of this nation. And it, was, it wasn't something that had any of man's um, plans attached to it. There's a few kids with a couple of guitars and a box drum who were just praising God and praying. And God moved in a powerful way. Only God could have planned for what was going to happen to have happened. 360 plus hours of continual worship and praise took place. But it happened before that. There have been men and women for years who have been praying for this to happen. And when God knew this was breaking out, He also knew that there would be a service of sending and of calling us to continue God's work that was already scheduled. You see, man had already scheduled for the Collegiate Day of Prayer to meet at Asbury this year. Only God could have planned that, right? And if you haven't seen it yet, it's, it's out there. You can find it on YouTube and other places. You can watch it. I encourage you to do that. And as you do it, um, they will call the people to prayer several times and pray with them. Seek the Lord with them. You will find that He is moving in a powerful way. As we were watching, several students shared how God had been meeting them in the two plus weeks prior to that. The students shared how God had delivered many of them from the bondage of depression and anxiety and suicidal tendencies and thoughts, which are the benchmarks of today's generation Z, I believe it is. I sound like an old guy now, because I'm one young, but I don't know what happened to why. But anyway, we're in. Anyway, but they were sharing how God had delivered them. And as I was listening to that, I was also noticed that they shared how God extended to them His love, His mercy, His grace, and forgiveness. And as I've been watching, I've been paying attention to this gathering at Asbury, how it's been sparking other gatherings at other places like Baylor University and many other places as well. Um, I begin to notice that there are some things that are common that keep coming up again and again. And one of them is that this happens through prayer. This isn't man's work. This is God's working. 
It happens through prayer and obedience. Men and women, young people, obeying what God is calling them to do. And as God began to move on, the students began to move on that place, and they began to listen to him, there, there came this repentance that came from humility. And then they began, and it really began with people forgiving one another. You see, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance, and you understand that he is forgiving me, and he's extending his grace and his mercy to me, and I'm a forgiven, I'm a child of God, there's a next step. Because God says the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. When revival breaks out and we begin to experience God's repentance, the next step of that is, is I'm going to begin to forgive my brother and my sister. And when there is an offense, I'm going to begin to seek to reconcile that offense. When I know I have been wrong, I'm willing to say, I am wrong. And one of the things that we heard students share is, I am now worshiping with someone and loving them whom I didn't like before. See, God's not content for us to say, I'm a follower of Christ, but I don't like these people or that person or this person because I have good reason to. God says, no, you don't. And I began to think Thursday night as I was watching this and I was looking at some of the students' face and listening to what was happening... All I could think of was this promise from Psalm 68, 5. I will be a father to the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy place. Jesus is enough. Jesus is what we need. Jesus is what we are seeing and how we are seeing uh, God move. And when we encounter God and we surrender our life, Christ changes us. One young man talked about how he, he came into um, one of the evening gatherings at Asbury. He came into the thing and, he, and he, he got there late. He was upset he got there late. He said, I was filled with pride. I had to sit in the balcony and I was upset and I was angry. And God began to move on him. And by the end of the night, he had surrendered his pride to the Lord and his life and, re, and, restore, and, and repented of, of his sin and gave his life back to the Lord. And he said, at the end of the night, I turned around and I took a picture of my seat. And I said, because he said, that is my gravestone. The old me is gone. It's dead. I'm alive in Christ. See, moves of God, encountering God, is understanding that I have been made alive in Christ. This morning, we're beginning the series, Jesus in the Wild. And the title of the message is Lessons on Calling for Life in the World. Jesus Christ came promising us eternal life. And that comes only through him and through knowing him. And we need to understand as followers of Christ or someone who is seeking Christ, I hope you have surrendered your life to Christ, that you can have life in Christ. Our calling begins with knowing that my life has been changed and transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is who changes me. Luke chapter 3, I want to go to verses 21 and 22 um, in a few moments. But before I do, I just want to give a little bit of, um, of background as to what's going on in the life of Jesus at this point, up to this point. Jesus is now launching his public ministry. He's 30 years of age, and this public ministry we know is going to, to last about three and a half years, which will take him to the cross, Right? And in that three and a half years, when he goes to the cross, we know that's not the end. Up to that point, the cross only meant death. It was an instrument of torture and capital punishment. But Jesus set that all on its ear because Jesus defeated the cross. He rose again. And now the cross is a symbol of victory for us because Jesus defeated death and sin in the grave. So it was the beginning Jesus is alive. But Jesus began his public ministry at age 30, and as he began, people listened to him, and they began to respond to him. Jesus preached a message of repentance. And he said, come and see and repent and believe. Follow me. Jesus' ministry sparked an awakening that changed the course of history. Jesus' ministry changed everything. Jesus' ministry is why you're here today.
Jesus calls us to repent and believe on him. Jesus came that you and I may have life. And Jesus said that you may have life and have it to the full. And as we are reading in chapter 3, we see that John the Baptist was also called of God. And he was a, he was a prophet pointing people to the Messiah. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know, do you understand that if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, then you have a calling to point people to Jesus? You have a calling. Your name doesn't have to be John. You have a calling to point people to Jesus. Um, we have a calling to do that. John the Baptist was, was given this calling, and the Bible says that he brought this message in the wilderness. Bible shows us that Jesus physically lived in the wilderness. It says this in Matthew uh, chapter 3 of the New Testament. I'll just read it for you quickly here. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who is spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. We know that John the Baptist brought his message and lived in the wilderness. He lived in places that were often lacking from what we would consider necessary resources. We know that because of his diet. Right? I mean... Locust and wild honey. I like honey. I'm not sure I like locust. Um, but, this, but John brought this message and people were hungry to hear the message. It was also a time that was difficult. It was during the time of Herod. Herod was, was, was not a ruler that they were happy to serve under. John was, was calling out sin, was calling people to change. And people were hungry to hear more about the Messiah, and, and they, would, they were coming out to hear him, and there was this movement happening that was of God in the midst of a life that was difficult. In John's life and his testimony, we see fulfillment only comes through relationship and dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, when John saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming, he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And for him to say that at that time was to say, look, this is the Messiah. This is God. He and the Father are one, and he is going to take away your sin. He's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. It was a bold thing for him to say. And his message was a re message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and people responded, and they were baptized. The Holy Spirit was moving. And it says in Luke 3, 21, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. People had been responding to this message and Jesus came to John to be baptized. Now prior to that, people were coming and the Gospel of Luke shows us that people were coming to Jesus and they had questions, or coming to John and they had questions. The Bible says um, that John was speaking to the crowds. Look at 3 verse 7. It says, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is ready at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John said to them, he said, who warned you? Why did you come here? Who warned you that you need to turn? And he said, you need to live a life in keeping with repentance. You need to understand that your, your solutions... What you're trying to do, your, your own efforts will fall short. You need to repent. And he was calling all who came to hear him to repentance. 
says this is a point of decision. We know, I pray that you know, that the cross demands a decision. The Lord Jesus Christ demands a decision. Will you follow him? It says in verse 10, they said, what should we do? And John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none. The one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors came. They came to be baptized. They said, we want to be forgiven. We want to repent. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? John said, don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. He said to them, be honest. Have integrity. Have character. Soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting and wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the, be the Christ. And John answered them all, I baptize with water, but one more powerful than I will come. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we know shortly after that, Jesus came to John to be baptized. Now, Jesus wasn't a sinner. Jesus was, was born without sin. He's fully God and fully man. But Jesus came showing that he was submitted to the will of the Father. And then he is affirmed by the Father. You are my son, whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. What that must have been like for those who were there to hear that audible voice from heaven and to see the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, knowing that this was a holy moment. The Bible says that Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 4 begins with this. 4 verse 1, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Jesus' ministry begins with him surrendering to the Lord and showing that I'm submitted to your will, Lord. I'm going to live out the calling you have for me. Jesus knew what it would demand from him. He says, I'm submitted to this, Lord. And then the Spirit leads him into the desert. And his ministry begins with prayer and fasting in a dry place. And the Bible says he is also tempted Living out our calling always begins with our seeking the face of God. Always seek, begins with us seeking to be near to God. Understanding that God has called us for a greater purpose comes, comes from our understanding. I need to depend on Him for everything. And, and we all need to have those times where we get away from what distracts us from God. We need to do that. There are, there are so many ways in which we can do that. Steve gave some examples last week about putting, putting that phone away, right? And he mentioned there's a little, phones all have a place where you can get to where it shows you how often you pick up your phone. That'll convict you. Or if you intentionally choose to fast from a meal or two during the day or for, for a day, you will realize and, and you'll come to understand, I really, I really am seeking God here because see, we, we're sustained by food, right? We know that. And when we miss it for a while, when we begin to get a little hungry, we can focus and say, boy, Lord, I really need to depend on you. I really need to hunger for you. I need to thirst for you. So we need to find ways in which we can know we can really seek the face of God. We need that. Because it's in our seeking God that God prepares us. It's in our seeking God that we learn the Word of God. Some of you have been memorizing Scripture. That's an important thing to do. We need to know Scripture. We need to know how to pray Scripture. We need to know how to use Scripture. We need to, scripture helps us when we are tempted. Look what happens in John chapter 4. Jesus is tempted. 
The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, this is verse 3, tell this stone to become bread. Do you imagine the audacity of Satan? He is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. There never has been. He's a fallen angel. He has the audacity to tempt God. He wants to destroy. If I can, if I can just get God to rely on me, that would destroy the whole thing. And he knows that, that Jesus, while he was walking here on earth, is, is walking in human form. It's, he's God in flesh, and everything he's going to accomplish, he accomplishes through prayer, prayer with his Father. He shows us how to do that. So Satan begins to tempt him. If you're the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered with Scripture. It is written, man does not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I will give you all, I will give you their authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will be, it will all be yours. Satan wants to destroy our allegiance. And Jesus answers him again with scripture. You see why it's important we learn scripture, friends? Jesus answers him, he says, it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. How often are we tempted to worship something that is not of God? And you may think, well, no, I'm not. I've never tried to pray to anything. Has anything ever controlled your life so much that it consumes you and all you do is think about that? You're worshiping that. Any person consumes you so much that you forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a priority that's out of whack. Idolatry is close to all of us if we're not careful. Jesus says, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 9, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand in the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from there. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their, in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. So Satan begins to twist Scripture and put it into his own context and say, hey, hey, Jesus, just, just see if this is true. And Jesus answers him again. It, is, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished his tempting, he left him alone until an opportune time. Jesus would be tempted throughout his ministry, but Jesus would use his relationship with the Father and Scripture to put Satan away every time. We're moving toward Easter, right? In a few weeks, we know that Jesus agonized in the garden. The Bible says, because Jesus knew he was going to be arrested, he knew he was going to go to the cross, the Bible says he agonized to the point where his sweat became droplets of blood. He was stressing in anxiety. Do we understand he was being tempted at that time to avoid the cross? And what does Jesus say as he's praying in the garden and as his friends are falling asleep? He says, not my will, but your will be done, Lord. Lord, I want your glory and your purposes to be done. I will do this because it is my purpose and my calling to be the Lamb of God. The gospel message is good news because Jesus has indeed given his life for us and he has risen again and we can know him and he has showed us how to live out our calling to be his witnesses in this world. He has showed us the importance of being close and walking in that relationship with him, of understanding, of, the, of learning the word of God and using the word of God. Jesus will put us in places of testing and Jesus' testing will always build us up Satan will work to tempt you, and that will always be to tear you down. And Satan's temptation will, will, will give you things of confusion, will bring you to points of anger and frustration, but Jesus' testing will lift you up. Jesus in his life shows us and teaches us how to live out our purpose and our calling. And I am praying that as we move toward Resurrection Sunday that you will be praying with me, Lord, help me to know you more. Just as we sang this morning, I want to know you more. 
Lord, help me to be awake to your leading in my life. Help me to obey you with what is next. I know you've been in a desert place. Maybe you're in a desert place now. I know you've been in a lonely place. I know you've been in places where you feel that God is silent. I have. These are times when we need to lean into the truth that God has not left us, but he is calling us to lean into him. In Jesus' testing, we see his submission to the will of his Father to live, in his, to live out his purpose. You know, I can tell you that in the hardest trials of life, God is there. And God lifts you up. And he loves you. And he shows you what's important. And temptation is there too. It is. And it's just, I, I, in, in my own life, I've struggled with, um, for many, many years, I used to struggle with the, with the beginning of Luke chapter 4 when it says the Holy Spirit took Jesus to the wilderness where he was tempted. Why would you do that, God? And I would look at it. No, the Holy Spirit can't take him there because the devil was going to tempt him. But I've learned in my life that God uses so many things in life to help us to grow. These dry things, these desert times, the wilderness things where everything seems to be empty and dead and thirsty and dry, God works and he moves. There was a period in my life after Larry Ann passed where Many, many days I was seeking the Lord and I was feeling his presence in the most powerful way I've ever had in my life. And I was closer to God than I'd ever been. But then there was times of temptation where I would say, you know, it's time for you just to forget all of this. Look for something that's just about you. That wasn't anything to build me up. That's from the devil. That's how you identify that. When it becomes all about you, that's a destructive thing. Because I've lived it all about me before and it doesn't go well. But as I lean into Christ, I begin to find joy in the midst of sorrow. And God is enough. When I looked at those young people's faces that were finding freedom, I know that God is enough. There's a testimony of a young girl. You can, you can find it if you watch it, and I'll, we'll, we'll try to share it later on. But she talks about being delivered from depression and anxiety. And she talked about how she gave it to Christ. And she was very honest. She said, you know, I still have moments where I want to be depressed. I still have some anxious thoughts. But I know my life is wrapped up in Christ. And he's helping me and I'm learning that I have a purpose now. Jesus is enough. And Jesus calls us to share his truth in the wilderness. The wilderness is all around us. Look at some news headlines today. I haven't looked at them yet, but it's evidence of wilderness and lost people. I'm sure of it. But at the same time, God is moving. This is a point in history where God is moving. God is calling his people to himself like we haven't seen in our lifetime. And it began before Asbury. How often have you, I mean, have you ever prayed for revival? 
be honest, tell me, a bunch of you have, right? You've prayed for revival. And when you pray for revival, you know God's going to move in a way you don't expect Him to move. And when we read in the Bible, when we see times where God is moving, you know He's moving in times that are very troubled. Jesus' ministry began in times that were troubled. And it was carried out in times that were troubled. People began to follow him. Jesus' movement grew exponentially. Over three years, the crowds became greater and greater. Jesus calls us to share his truth in the midst of the wilderness of people that are thirsty of knowing who Jesus is. Why are we seeing these great outpourings now? Because people are trusting things that are just lies. They're, they're, I mean, things that just don't make sense to the mind. They're, they're trying to trust in them. Just And everything people, many of the things our, our young people and even old people are trusting in just don't follow logical sense. I mean, I don't want to be flippant, but I don't get to choose if I'm a man or a woman. I'm not trying to be funny. That's a lie from the devil. And people are, people are destroying their lives believing things like that. I mean, destroying their life. But God is sharing his truth. There are men and women who have begun that path, and you know they've surrendered their life to Christ, and God's changing them. And he's helping them know that you are loved by God and your identity is found first in the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone comes to you and they're confused, don't try to fix their confusion on their own. Introduce them to Jesus first. And he will fix them. In his time, in his way, in his purpose, our call is to love and to share Jesus. And to know that this cross of Christ will demand a response from them. And the Holy Spirit will convict them and he will show them that I am not the Holy Spirit and neither are you. God's testing builds us up and it prepares us to share his truth, his way. And he will prepare you and he will show you and he will call you to times of surrender and he will show you things in your life that you need to give to him completely. And you will have times where you will fail. Right? Donna knows that. Been married long enough now where I've been imperfect one day. (laughs) I want us to be people who seek the face of God. I want to call you to be Men and women who will say, Lord, I want you to show me and I want you to change me where I need to be changed. Change every part of me so it's about you. Pastor Steve read to us from 1 Peter and I want to close with this and I want us to pray some of this. Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in, this, in the last time. We have this inheritance, and it is Jesus, and it is for you. And it won't go away. It does not perish, it does not spoil, it does not fade. It is kept for you. And Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And we get to meet him in the air. And I don't know what it's going to look like. But I want to take some people with me. You know. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Peter says, we'll have suffering, we'll have trials, we'll have testing, right? 
But our inheritance is still there. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Lord Jesus Christ, this is enough. He is holy. He's able to meet you where you are. He's able to help you to love people you never thought you could love or forgive. He's able to help deliver you from whatever it is. If you're able, let's stand and let's pray. If you want to, if, if you want to, if you want, if there are some who want to come and kneel, you can come and kneel as I pray. But let's just come before God right now. Let's just pray and seek Him as we as we um, close this part and prepare for Sunday school. Father, we love you, Lord. I thank you that you uh, you began your ministry, showing us the importance of surrender to the will of the Father. Lord, my. Our life, our calling begins with our life surrendered to you. Lord, I know, I know that uh, you're dealing with us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to come before you with our hearts, our minds focused on you. That we would be able to say, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you and I'm asking for you to show me that of which needs your attention. Lord, if you're calling us to, to begin a process of working through something where we, we seek to reconcile with someone or seek forgiveness, maybe we've, maybe we've wronged someone in some way. Or, Lord, maybe we've been embracing an attitude that is just not right. Or, Lord, maybe we've been unwilling to, uh, to let go of something that we, that we so desire and we think we need to have every right to hold on to it. And maybe in itself it's not a sinful thing, but it's not for us and we know it. Lord, help us to let go of those things and help us to trust you. Help us to be mindful that you uh, are working your will in incredible ways. And Lord, in this time and in history, you are awakening men and women of every age to the truth that they need you, that you alone are, what's bring, are what brings us fulfillment and purpose and joy and peace. It only comes from you. That man's solutions, all of them will fall short. But you, only in you can we find the fulfillment and the life that we need. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful in sharing your truth, of sharing your love, and of calling people to, to a repentance that brings them to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Lord, we praise you and we love you. We thank you for meeting with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.